world shocking red to last a weekend or forever. Your life what, deserves a little color. Like Your yeah. hair deserves yeah. something. I'm not looking at your ass. Ask for Triangle's hair design, Kitsilano. I'm meeting with... Dennis B. Hair Design on Robson. BCTV, we're giving it all we got. Good morning. I had an excellent night's sleep last night. Unlike my colleagues and unlike the legislators in Victoria who are continuing the dance of legislation by exhaustion entirely and totally, I am sure, in the public interest. But first in Victoria this morning, I want to talk to my man, Brian Coxford, and find out the physical state of affairs. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Jack, and I'm glad you had a good night's sleep. Did you? No, we were up all night, uh, as were uh, some of the MLAs. They uh, slept in shifts, we could say, uh, in makeshift dormitories in their caucus rooms. I don't know what a quorum, a quorum is in the House, but how many NDPs would be, NDPs would be there at, at a time? Well, they had a crucial vote at uh, 3 o'clock this morning on uh, Bill 6, second reading. That's the one that gives the government control of school board budgets. And the vote then was 28 to 7. Only seven NDPers showing up. And uh, Dave Barrett said that uh, he prefers to send his members in in shifts, uh, be it small, uh, and give them some rest. Where are they sleeping? In the caucus rooms on Camp Cots? Well, we saw one of the rooms, and it's, uh, it's almost like a makeshift mattress. I guess a, a piece of foam uh, wrapped with a bed sheet and a sleeping bag on top right uh, beside their uh, desk. So the social credit are much more dedicated to legislation by exhaustion because they had many more members in the House during the night. Well, I guess uh, we could, what we could say about that is that they just answer the bell when it rings. The bell is what wakens them up and gives them that, that informed opinion on which they can make their independent decision to vote for or against the government legislation. Assuming, of course, they're awake. Assuming they're awake. Anybody actually sleeping in the house? Well, oh yes. And that's, uh, that's one thing we wish you could, we could show you um, uh, from time to time. There Who was snores? A... Who snores? Uh, couldn't hear any snoring, but uh, definitely we could see uh, two, uh, perhaps three MLAs sleeping at a time. Uh, one of them was even listening to music. Oh, these little Jackman, is that what you call these things? A little uh, Walkman. Pac-Man. Uh, Walkman. Walk Walkman and reading the paper at the same time. St <laughs> well, that's the way to do the government's business. Anyway, stay on your toes. Don't you dare go for a nap or Bradbury will have you by the ears. Is that, is that clear? Yes, Jack. And one thing we should mention just before you go is uh, while they sit in the legislature, there's all these people behind the scenes, oh, perhaps uh, 30, maybe more people, the people in Hansard, uh, the librarians, uh, the security staff, the sergeant at arms, they're all on overtime at our expense. Does it give you a warm feeling about the considered way in which the public's business is being done? Well, uh, I don't think the, uh, the public would uh, consider what goes on here at night uh, very entertaining. In fact, it's quite boring, but I guess it's democracy in action. Brian, thanks very much uh, for your contribution to uh, our sum total of human knowledge this morning. Now, my program for this morning should be, if I'm sure they're all wide awake, I don't know how much they slept, but I'm going to have Bill Ritchie, the Municipal Affairs Minister of whom it is said he has put more feet and more mouths sooner than any other appointed Cabinet Minister. He's the Minister of Municipal Affairs. And then later on for that delicate balance one must do a repertorial coverage I have the new NDP boy from Victoria by the name of Robin Blinko who happens by chance to be the NDP critic in municipal affairs. And then later on, just to see who we can annoy, we certainly will annoy Brian Smith, I know, we've got Alec Vey of the Vancouver Island Human Rights Coalition who got money from the feds and I want to find out if it's really true that they got this money from the feds. That's the liberals, liberals in Ottawa, people who gave 600000 on the face of it 
to Operation Solidarity, and they got money from the feds to fight the social credit legislation on human rights. Now, I don't know if that's clinically accurate, but we'll find out about that from Alec Vey. And our first guest this morning from Victoria, bright, alert, and with it, is the Honorable Bill Ritchie, Minister of Municipal Affairs after the break. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Ritchie. Nice of you to come to our studio in Victoria. Good morning, Jack. It's always nice to come to your studio. Are you, are you awake, Willie? Yes, sir. Look at me, night. Bright eyes and ready to go. Oh, I think you look a little bit heavy lidded to say the least. How much sleep did you get last night? Oh, I would think uh, all told about maybe an hour and a half. Isn't this a stupid caper, though? Legislation by exhaustion, stupid on both sides. Well, Jack, you know, the opposition want to talk, and uh, if they want to do all this talking, uh, we just can't afford to, uh, to break in the evenings. Uh, we just have to uh, get all the time we can in and get this talk over with so, so we can get on with the business. But, you know, Willie, you're fiddly new in Parliament. Don't you realize that that's what the legislature is for? Not a dime without debate, unlimited talking, and that strange, well, strange quick ruling by Walter Davidson, your buddy, is certainly very worrying. Well, uh, uh, Jack, uh, whenever the leader of the opposition disobeys the chair, uh, you know, you've got to make a ruling. You can't allow that to happen, otherwise it'd be totally out of control. But uh, really... Uh, Gosh, uh, it's totally out of control now. What are you talking about? Well, uh, not really, uh, Jack. We got some business through last night, and I uh, can see some movement now uh, that uh, they're getting a lot of this talking out of their system. Bill, uh, you've made your mark in this province as outspokenly anti-union. You're obviously in favour of right to work, and you are on the very right-wing spectrum of social credit. That's correct, is it not? No, Jack, I'm not anti-union. I'm uh, supportive of unions. You must know that, uh, coming from the same part of the old country as I do. Oh, we've got many right-wingers from Glasgow. That's right, uh, Jack. Uh, but I believe in democracy out there, and certainly I, I come from an area that uh, is uh, right-wing. Uh, and uh, no, uh, right to work is not the thing at all. Democracy in the workplace, I believe, Jack, that, uh, that's, that right. that's what it's all about. Make it easier to smash the unions, because yeah. they, they've overplayed their hands, haven't they, the well, unions? Well, I think, uh, Jack, uh, there are a number of areas where uh, they've gone a little too far, and it's now time to roll back to some reality in the interest of the people. That roll know. it right back. We don't need unions anymore, do we? Oh, yes, you bet we do. We always will, Jack. Now, let's get down to some cases. Sure. Because you're described as a hitman who won't last. Is it true? I find it hard to believe in 1983 that you have actually proposed that the fox be set among the chickens, that real estate developers do the planning for municipalities. You said that. Jack, uh, didn't that, you? No, 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 oh. I didn't say that at all. Uh, it sounds like you've been uh, reading the, the uh, print media, and I'm surprised that you, that you would let that influence you. I'm pleased to be on here to set the record straight. Okay, set the record straight. Are you in favor of, of severely restricting regional authority to initiate and approve official plans? Yes, uh, Jack, uh, I believe that that official uh, regional plan is unnecessary and I really uh, do not believe that it's correct that that regional board should have veto power over land use or zoning within a municipality. And you believe that in other words, the municipality should do their own planning? Why certainly, Jack. Uh, do you know that in the Greater Vancouver Regional District where most of the complaints are coming from, there are 15 municipalities and three electoral areas. Would you believe that there are only two of those municipalities with an official community plan in place? So here we are, we have municipalities out there who are saying, we are not prepared to put an official plan in place in our community, but we want to protect that regional plan out there with the veto power so that if there's another municipality who wants to do something that we don't like, then through this regional plan, this veto power, we'll be able to say to them, no, you can't do that. You and Walter Davidson, the speaker, both want the GVRD scrapped, don't you? No, you cannot scrap the GVRD, Jack, nor can you scrap any regional districts. Regional districts have a very important function. Don't forget that regional districts are required to provide all of the settlement planning throughout the province, the unorganized areas. There are also uh, areas, that mainly the metropolitan areas, where uh, municipal governments can, through the regional districts, provide services jointly at least cost much more efficiently than they can without. How many planners but, do you want to see fired? You must be going to use Section 
Uh, five it is of Bill 3 to get rid of all these unnecessary planners. Jack, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be up to the original districts uh, to do that. Uh, I won't be firing any planners. That's their responsibility. Bill 3 gives them the ability to manage in the interest of the taxpayer. Uh, and you want to see a number of these unnecessary planners fired, don't I, you? I, I, I want to see un any unnecessary expense uh, removed because the taxpayer can't afford it. You know, right at the back of all of this, Bill, and I want to be quite fair about this, sure. and I noticed that the Speaker moved out the chair during a discussion on the Spedford Bill, because apparently of a conflict of interest of some kind if he were to vote. But you know perfectly well, Bill Ritchie, that the GVRD stymied the Cabinet decisions approving development of the Spedford property isn't that correct? In Delta, in Davidson's writing. Jack, the GVRD have been in and out of that thing and messing around now for quite some time. And you're but determined they're not going to mess around in it anymore? As far as I am concerned, Jack, the, the no regional district is going to mess around in any municipalities that applies to their own zoning and their own land use. Jack, there wasn't all this kerfuffle whenever the 700 odd acres was taken out to Tilsbury Island. Where were all these people screaming, uh, where were they then? We didn't hear a thing. Yeah, no, but it looks bad, Bill, you know. I, I know. It really looks bad. Here's Walter Davidson campaigning for the spate of our lands. He's the Speaker of the House. He doesn't take part in debate. And then all of a sudden, why, in comes Bill 9, which absolutely guts the powers of the GVRD. Okay. No, 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 Jack, that's not right. But let's not forget that uh, uh, look, Walter Am Davidson, I wrong? Am I wrong in my interpretation? Yeah, yeah you're, you're wrong. Where am I wrong? Yeah, well, you're wrong this way. First Where of all, am I wrong? Well, first of all, Walter Davidson is the MLA for Delta and he has a, a duty to, to perform there. Secondly, uh, Bill 9 does not gut the, the GVRD. Bill 9 r merely removes the veto power in that official regional plan from all regional districts. Jack, not only do we have to do that, but I'm going to tell you that I intend to take the time to look into all regional districts and all of the things they're doing because there's a level of government in there that the community cannot afford. Do you not agree with Walter Davidson that the GVRD should be scrapped? No, no, you can't scrap the GVRD. The GVRD is playing a very important function, but I intend to look into it, Jack, to see what they are doing, why they're doing it, and how they're doing it, because take, for instance, their housing program. I'm not certain at this point. I'll find out as I get into it. But I understand that in their social housing program, they have a, a fair number of vacancies in there, the cost of which are being capitalized. That means, Jack, that that community within the GVRD have a growing mortgage. Not a decreasing mortgage, but a growing mortgage. These things concern me. They concern me because the taxpayer of this province can't afford it. Also, Jack, there's a lot of regulation out there that has been built up and built up over the years with the bureaucrats and, and with the, uh, with the uh, GVRD that we must remove because it's, it creates a great deal of uncertainty out there. Okay, I understand you now, Willie. Okay. You, you're, you are, just don't go away yet. No, I won't go did away. Did you or did you not say that developers could do a better job of planning municipalities than the municipalities, and that you could only do it every five years. Let the foxes no, into the chicken. No, Jack, that's garbage. Listen, what, what did I, you say? No, no, what I said was this, Jack, that, that every municipality should have an official community plan so that they remove the uncertainty uh, in the community. The, this uncertainty, it's, un, it's mm -hmm. impossible to put a price on it because of the roadblocks and the red tape that's put in the, in the way of people who want to build a little house. And you're telling me you but, are not gutting the powers of the GVRD, you're going to immediately remove regulation. No, that, just let me finish, Jack. What I did say was that each municipality should have an official regional plan, and in order to do that, they have to go through all the different uh, hoops, including the uh, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Highways, and into my ministry. When that's done, we've removed the uncertainty out there. Okay, okay. more more with Bill Ritchie. No, no. Don't go away, Billy. Okay. Bill. The okay. Honorable William Ritchie, yeah. after the break. Bill Ritchie is the Minister of Municipal Affairs, and he is part of the government apparatus, which is determined to deregulate where it can, reduce restraint, and cut the size of the civil service. That's correct, isn't it? That's right, Jack. Good, right on the bed. Jack, could I, could I answer one other question that you brought sure, up? Sure, sure. Uh, you talked about uh, giving the planning to developers. Now, Jack, uh, that's entirely wrong. What I did say was that uh, I would like to see and will expect to see municipalities put in place an official community plan 
and I believe that if that could be done at uh, less cost than by in-house, then it, it could go to the private sector. And I also said that there is no need for a general review of that plan within five years and in many cases up to ten years. That does not mean to say, however, that there will be need for some adjustments, ongoing adjustments, minor ones. Okay, in other words, to put it in Webster language, you have no objection to the use of cheaper consultants to do the municipal plans which will be reviewed every five and ten years. Right, sir. Consultant, that's the point. Now, right. you see, I can't get Walter Davidson on the air. I'd love to have Walter yeah. on the air about his particular interest in Delta and the Spetifor lands. But yeah. do you agree with Walter? Sounds like you do. No. Now, one of the troubles with the GVRD is it's a bunch of communists and socialists. Oh. And that that's the real trouble why you've got to clip the wings. Jack. You agree with them? No, no, Jack. You don't? No, no, no. I, I, I don't. I can't say that at all. I know we got a, we got a few real strong left wingers in there, and we don't hide that. And uh, uh, that's there, and, and they don't make any bones about it. But I'm working with these people all the time, and as long as they cooperate with me and work with me, fine. But if they let their partisan politics get my way, then uh, I, I will deal with them in another route. Oh, partisan politics, of course, are the name of the game. Well, that's, that's, that's right. That's why 45% of the people vote NDP. Yeah, but Jack, uh, don't forget that when you're talking municipal politics, you're, you're directly uh, 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 servicing the people out there. We have programs and services to provide to these communities, and uh, I would say that anybody that wants to build their political image, they should do it by the results and, and then get polit political uh, election do you, time. Do you have much in the way of real estate holdings yourself, Bill? I'm just asking for you know general uh, information. No, not a, not a great deal, uh, Jack, uh, really. You, no, don't, no. you don't have any land in Delta no, or anywhere no, else? No, 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 I don't. Uh, I got five acres, prime five acres, uh, where our home is, and uh, I raised some sheep on that, like I believe you used to. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, uh, and you're not planning to subdivide them? No, no, sir, no, no, no. <laughs> never been in that, Jack. Never uh, never got interested in it at all. Uh, you know my background. I'm a feed manufacturer. Oh, and I don't want to talk about your background. Well, the NDP raises it enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be fair for me to, to drag up old sores, well, would it? But, but you're pretty fair, Jack. No, I'm not the least bit well, fair. Right. You see, what baffles me about a guy like you, you're so outspoken on the yeah. campaign, you, yeah. you get quoted by reporters, I know to be good reporters, but when you come to me, you're suddenly an awful lot more modest. Well, Jack, uh, that's because you're fair and modest, and I because understand every word you say. Well, that's something between us anyway. Okay. That's right. They, they, I regard your change. No, many critics regard your changes to Bill 9 as a specific weapon to allow the Spetifor property be to be developed to its fullest extent. Is that not a valid criticism of your changes to Bill 9? That's uh, Jack political gamesmanship and nonsense, Jack. I, if we had the time, I could go into other situations where this regional plan. Uh, has has had some effects as well. No, Jack, how about the Tillsbury land? You know, I could go on. There, there are many other situations where there's been some conflict as to... Uh, okay, two points. Uh, if you're so happy and proud of your potential deregulation and cutting staff, and that's your target, and that you can't deny, and many right. people support your aims and objects, right. why did the UBCM unanimously denounce Bill 9? You know, Jack, before the convention, I traveled the province. I spoke to uh, many, many of our mayors and aldermen, and I am getting a very, very positive response to it. In fact, some of them are saying eliminate regional districts altogether. Ah. Jack, there was a vote there, and I wasn't there for the vote because I was busy meeting with councils. But let me assure you that I have been listening and I'm getting a good, strong reading that indeed we are on the right track. You may uh, well be. The fact remains is that you've wiped out the powers of the school boards to control the budgets. You've uh, restricted public input and many other crown corporations. Why not just wipe out the GVRDs no, no. throughout the province and save a lot of money? Now listen, Jack, let's, let's just get off the GVRD alone because it's only one of 28 regional districts. Agreed. And Why not wipe them all out? No, yeah. no, no, no. Let's talk in a broad sense. You know, we have a responsibility to the taxpayers of this province. And let me assure you, Jack, that that as we move along, and as I move along in this ministry, no doubt we will uncover other areas where savings can be made. Uh, Jack, I get concerned whenever I hear of large investments in land by municipalities 
uh, which uh, may be held there hoping that markets will rise, in the meantime losing income because they can't uh, apply any property tax to that. Jack, we have to look at all of those things. We have to look at the value for dollars spent at the municipal level and the regional district level, and it's my responsibility to do that, to make sure we're okay, getting the best value for Okay, you made a dollars. couple of good points there. Do you yeah. plan to make it cheaper and to reduce the extravagant standards of municipalities for subdivisions? Jack, I, uh, I'm hoping that whenever we get all of these community plans in place, that there will be the, the, those people in, the, in the, uh, the area of providing housing will have a, will have a lot of this red tape removed from their, from their way, and it will cost less money, and ultimately it'll cost less for housing. I happen Yet to be with you in that, because out in Surrey and other municipalities, it became impossible to develop modest housing because of the underground wiring and all the the civic regulations and controls, did it not? Jack, it's an absolute disgrace. I've gone through building an industrial plant and it's an absolute disgrace some of the nonsense that we have to go through. And this is what happens when you allow a bureaucracy to build up. And you, want, you, you may well be on the right track. You want to get at that regional district and the planning bureaucracy to make it more efficient to buy houses and make it cheaper for ordinary people, right? right? Jack, I want streamlined government with maximum autonomy at the municipal level and I want least cost government that we'll all benefit from. You better be careful what you say in future so that I don't throw quotes at you which you have to modify. Now, well, one last question. Yeah. What about that 700 beautiful acres down at Colony Farm. Are you going to get rid of that and turn it into an industrial park? Jack, you'll have to ask the Honorable Harvey Schrader on that. He's the minister responsible uh, for that. Oh, uh, he, what is he now? Farm. He's minister of food and agriculture. Oh, he's the agriculture minister. Right, and he's, uh, he's the man that can answer that. That's in his, uh, his area of responsibility. That sure would be a scandal, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no comment necessary. I, I wish I were in the studio with you. I can see by the look in your face. Anyway, uh, you don't believe the GVRD and the other. Oh, you're going to wipe out the island's trust. Now, there's an unnecessary appendage which costs money. Well, the, the, you the, almost wiped it out last year, but then you chickened out on it. Not me, Jack, but. Uh, the government did. Yeah, but, Jack, uh, they will be modified. Uh, they too will have to live up to their. Uh, their, their obligations to provide the uh, least cost government and uh, we will be looking at all of their activities just like we are. At Why the don't you reintroduce the bill and wipe them out? No, 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 Jack. I'm going to be introducing a lot of the good stuff that that bill contained, but it will be done by way of amendments to the Municipal Act over a period of time. I, I, I don't want to bite off too much at one time. Okay, Mr. Ritchie, Minister of Municipal Affairs, I am grateful for your presence this morning, heavy lady though you may be, and you might find that you're up all over the weekend. Yeah, could be, Jack. Let me tell you, too, for the record, that um, uh, UBCM convention was good. It was positive. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Why did everybody hate you? I don't know, Jack. Uh, the, the, that's, the, that's the print media for you. It was a good convention, and I was well received, and they were happy, and it was a good positive feeling for you what we're doing. You just can't trust the print media. Well, you, you said that, Jack. At least in, on Webster, you can take your lumps and you don't get cut. And that's the way I like it. Okay, boy. Thank you very much, the Honourable Bill Ritchie. I'll be back with Robin Blanco, a good friend of yours, after the break. Thanks, Jack. The only member of the legislature whom I have not previously met, believe it or not, is the man coming on now from Victoria, Robin Blanco of the NDP. Good morning, Robin. Morning, Jack. Uh, you were sleeping most of the night, I understand, in a shoddy cot in the caucus room. No, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm one of the lucky ones. I live in Victoria and I managed to get home to my family for three or four hours for a little, little sleep. You cheated. <laughs> well, I live close by. All right, a little bit about you. How old are you? 35. What do you do for a living when you're not uh, lounging around the legislature? Well, I used to do some work at the University of Victoria. I've uh, done some social work and I've also done uh, some work for the Attorney General's Department, developing some alternative programs. Oh my, a social worker and alternative programs, you are a bleeding heart NDP, <laughs> and is that not so? Yeah, well, you know, I've also, Jack, done some uh, little underground work mining and stuff over the years as well, so a, a varied background, you might say. I've got a fair amount of sympathy, I might tell you right off the top, no matter how I question Mr. Um, what's his name, Richie. Sure. That uh, municipalities are feather bedded half to death. The planning departments, especially one in Vancouver City Hall, yep. is a vast monolith of highly paid people whose business, whose job is to obstruct development and businessmen. And surely there are some good things 
in uh, our friend Richie's bill? Well, Jack, uh, I don't want to reflect on municipalities and what they do with their planning departments. I, w I would also, I'd only say that uh, municipalities have been practicing restraint for years and years. Uh, I was involved in, on the uh, City of Victoria Council for six years, in the last two years, Chairman of Finance. We can't run deficits, so we have to balance the books each year, and uh, uh, that restraint is always there. And I th they've always looked for a way to save dollars. And if you want to go look at the studies and the reports from people about their attitudes to municipal government, they trust them the most of any level of government. They also feel they're the most accessible and they're accountable. But you know perfectly well in the four-day week city halls you can't get a committee together because people are off on Mondays and Fridays and that something had well, to be done to tighten the purse strings and get people back to work five days a week when the boss wants them. I, well, that didn't happen in the city of Victoria. What happens in other municipalities, that's uh, I can't uh, happens speak in for. The pro happens in the provincial government. Sure. Is that not a good aspect of their... Well, of their arbitrary action to take back control of working hours so that people work a five-day week and you can get committees at least together. Oh, I totally agree with you, Jack. I think oh. uh, m municipalities uh, uh, should be accountable five days a week. Uh, and, and government employees. And government employees, certainly. Certainly. I think uh, no one disagrees that uh, if you're supposed to work five days, you work five days. We don't have any disagreement with that. In other words, no, but I'm saying wiping out the four-day week and the four- five-day week, that's part of the arbitrary action of Bill 2. Now, I thought you would have objected to that in the greatest heat. Well, you know, Jack, uh, there, are, there are a number of things uh, that we're objecting in various pieces of legislation that uh, uh, we, we certainly disagree with. And there's, you know, uh, often we get portrayed as opposing everything. Clearly, there are sometimes things we can support. But at the moment we have legislation, the, ov the overwhelming component of the legislation is something we have to object to in terms of, particularly for municipalities and local government, is the heavy centralization into the hands of the cabinet. All right, you spell out to me what this does and spell out to me, if you wish, Bill the nine? situation in Bill 9. Right. Uh, and the speaker who did not take part in the debate, I presume, I can only presume because of a potential conflict of interest. Yes. Uh, you spell out to me how you regard uh, Bill Bennett's legislation and Bill 9. Now, try not to interrupt. I want, okay. to, be, I want you to be tough on <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Well, very, very simply and very concise, uh, the municipalities and regional districts have clearly outlined their opposition, virtually overwhelming opposition to Bill 9, Jack. At the latest, at the last, uh, the latest convention at the UBCM, there was a resolution which was virtually unanimous, asking the minister to withdraw Bill 9. The simple fact of the matter is that particularly in urban regions, when you have municipalities that are adjacent to each other, you've got to have an overall plan that developers and planners and, and, and people, private sector and public sector know what the rules are. And that's very important. Uh, with the land, last Land Use Act, the HUDAC and the Urban Development Institute clearly said that uh, you know, uh, we, we may agree with some of your components of what you want to do, but let us know the rules. Let us know what each municipality agrees to in a region, because what you start to have is an incredible fight no municipality can agree. One municipality say, I don't want that development, go somewhere else. And that poor developer, that poor person in the free enterprise system, is subjected to incredible complicit uh, uh, confrontation and, uh, and uh, can't get a decision from anybody. You're just telling me what Richie told me. He wants to simplify the well, whole thing. This doesn't simplify it, Jack, because when you don't have an overall view, you don't have something everybody agrees to in a contigu contiguous area. What about the, the special yeah, lands in Delta? What yeah. did, do, you, yeah. do you suggest, uh, uh, maybe it was you, or certainly some of your party who suggested that the whole root of Bill 9 was to free lands such as Spedivore and lands like them for massive real estate development? Well, that's, that's a, major, that's a con very controversial issue. Do you agree with that I, view or I, not? I agree with that basic premise. Uh, the GVRD has taken a number of positions, virtually unanimously again, Jack, that the Spedivore should be protected. Uh, there have been a number of incredible statements, one from the Speaker of this House, uh, Walter Davidson, who is a member for Delta, saying that uh, they would find some ways to get that development through on Spedifor. And of course, a few days later, Bill 9 was introduced. Uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, that uh, to, to accomplish their ends, or the Cabinet's ends, they're prepared to abandon regional districts in terms of comprehensive planning so they know where they're going for the, to try and get through Spedifor. It's, uh, again, it's, it's symbolic of what this government is doing. If they don't like something at the local level, and I remind the cabinet, I remind people out there that people elected, they elect their directors, they elect their municipal people, and they make decisions. If they don't like those decisions, they vote them out of the election. But what cabinet says is, well, during, be between elections, we don't like some of your decisions, we're going to find ways to overturn you. 
That's a basic violation of their democratic rights at the local level. And as again, Jack, people believe in the local level because I think they think they're more democratic. More with Robin Blanco, NDP Victoria. Who's your sidekick in? Gordon Hanson. Gordon Hanson, yes. Right. More with Robin Blanco after the break. Robin, you come across this morning as a very polished, knowledgeable, young, bleeding heart NDP. But I understand. <laughs> yeah, sure you do. But I understand you've used some very strong language, unparliamentary, to describe the premier of this province, and that you have made other signs and signals and shouts in the house. Oh, do, do it to me! Come on, I want to make you human. <laughs> what, uh, in terms of the premier, uh, Jack, I've asked him over and over again in my particular bills and various parts of the, leg the debate on various pieces of legislation, I've asked him to take a second look at pieces of uh, what's, what's before us. Did you show? And, and, and I've, no, 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 I referred and I, and I said that uh, he should take a leaf out of his father's book. His father, WAC, was well known that uh, when there seems to be some concern expressed in the province and you've got a, you know, clearly a message coming from all walks of life in this province that maybe you've gone too far, that you've overstepped the mark in terms of your mandate, you should take a second look. And I, I will continue to ask the Premier to do that. I think that's reasonable, that's responsible, and that is indeed a mark of good leadership. Yeah, Unfortunately, what? he doesn't seem prepared to do that, Jack. Well, you see, I'm just trying to make you human. <laughs> uh, did you call him Adolf Bennett? No, 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 you no, didn't. no, 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 I, no, no. I withdraw, I apologize, no, no. I have been wrongly advised. No, 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 no. And you didn't shout Sieg Heil either, obviously. Well, there was a number of, uh, when they uh, kicked oh. Mr. Barrett out of the house, oh. uh, which was a very emotional time, unprecedented, there were a number of things uh, happening. You've got to, in the house sometimes, and particularly when the, when the leader is physically escorted for trying to take his position in the debate, and when the uh, speaker... Uh, clearly is in collusion with the government because the Premier right after made that decision went and packed him on the back and you know uh, obviously oh, I was see. congratulating. You'd be, you'd be we very, it was a very difficult time for us. Did you read that in Marjorie Nichols or did you see that yourself? Oh I saw that. Oh I saw that. You mean after? We all, we all, we all, we all uh, knew what was happening. After what you regarded as the arbitrary decision by collusion yes. whereby Davy Barrett was yes. shut up and an unprecedented yeah. Yeah. ruling made let me, let then me, it went over and patted yeah. the uh, who? Uh, prided, uh, prided Walter Davidson. On the back? Yeah. And smiled now, broadly. Let me make a point, Jack, about that uh, um, uh, removal of, of, uh, of Dave Barrett. Dave had already been speaking on that as the designated speaker for three, over three hours. If they were going to make that decision, they should have made it right after 40 minutes passed. Clearly, they decided that they had to remove Mr. Barrett from the House. They should have, if they wanted to set that ruling in place, it should be done after 40 minutes. It was established particularly to remove Mr. Barrett from the House because he has been being very forceful, expressing our views on Bill 3 clearly, and they had to remove him from the House. Un I hate to tell unprecedented. I hate to tell you this, uh, Robin, but uh, I get the feeling that while I regard that as an important parliamentary point yes. and a change of rules in midstream without yes. the Speaker even taking an adjournment right. to consider the application from Schroeder that 40 minutes was the time limit on that renewed debate, I have a feeling that the public looks on the NDP today as obstructionists, filibusterers, people are worried about the economy and they think these people are only opposing for the sake of opposing. Now what would you tell an intelligent teenager or young NDP today about the principle involved in that battle ejection? That's, that principle is extremely important to get over, Jack. But what is it? You know, what is well, it? What, uh, first, let me answer about the obstructionist view. We have let through various pieces of legislation over the last few weeks, allowing the government to continue on pieces of legislation that we don't believe are fundamental to, to basic rights and uh, centralization into cabinets of things that have traditionally been established at the local level. And uh, we have to get the message out there. If they can look at some sections of these bills, government by regulation, at, at whim they can change things as they like. You know, things like Bill 5. But, I mean, eviction without cause, Jack. You think about that. Eviction without no, no. cause. You've you know, missed, that has to be stopped. You've missed the point. I know perfectly well that even though Barrett was stopped and ejected, yes. that every member can speak on everything for as long virtually on every single amendment, every no. section of every bill, minutes. in second and third readings, you know. It can go on forever. And will that not eventually, no matter your opposition, unless you all were to well, resign from the House and Bill, create by-elections? Yeah, Jack, all we have as a, as, a, as a democratic elected opposition 
is the ability to, uh, to speak to issues, to clearly put out what the concerns are, and allow the community to react. That's the only, that's the only thing we have. And we're speaking about, I think, and our party thinks, some basic radical change in the social fabric of this province. And make no mistake about it, that's what's happening. Now this you're talking about the rentalsmen, you're talking this about This government consumer. is on a mission, Jack, and uh, I think uh, the people must understand that the province as they know it today is going to be changed tomorrow. And we've, a lot of those things we've accepted as norm in a free and democratic and progressive civilized society. You mustn't forget he did clearly win the election and has in fact a mandate. No, well, Jack. In fact. Sure, he got a mandate May 5th, but what did he get a mandate for? Mandate I mean, for restraint, a mandate well, for cutting back. But Jack, he never told the people he was going to get rid of human rights. They denied they were getting rid of the rentalsmen. They, they, uh, they did not say there were speeches after speech made. They weren't going to make uh, heavy cuts in terms of, and, and the ways they did it on civil servants in this province. They did not tell the people those issues and those facts. And um, even loyal Socrates, who have quietly spoke to many of us, that they, they are really disturbed. And they are trying to get Mr. B Mr. Bennett, like his father, to look, I take a second look at what they're doing. But the business of the house must be done. And Absolutely. I, I suggest your Absolutely. filibuster and your tactics will collapse before October 31st. Well, Jack, uh, we uh, feel there's a, we have an obligation to the citizens of this province. It's very important, and we will continue to do our work. How We're long speaking... will you keep up the filibusters? Oh, Jack, I, I'm, you know, I'm only part one member of our caucus. Uh, we, have, we make democratic decisions about that. At the moment, Bill 3 upstairs is being debated. Uh, Gordon Hansen is the designated speaker and doing a fine job. And we will continue to talk about that particular bill. My thanks to Robin Blank. Co NDP member Thanks, for Victoria. Next, I'm going to talk to Alec Vey of a human rights group in Victoria who have got money from the feds and I want to find out what they're going to use it for. Thank you, Robin Blanco. Thank you, Jack. This program is for the record. I was fascinated by the attack by Attorney General Brian Smith on a grant to a coalition of Vancouver Island human rights groups. It's a blatant, sanctimonious interference in provincial affairs. Let's find out if after this interview we think he's right, because I have in Victoria Alec Vey. Good morning, Mr. Vey. Good morning. Of the Vancouver Island Human Rights Coalition. Is this money you, which federal department gave you the money and how much money is it? The Federal Department of the Secretary of State and the total amount we applied for and received is $19,050. And are you going, did you apply for this uh, for the specific purpose of fighting the social credit changes in the Human Rights Act, the scrapping of the old one and the building of the new one? The original idea for the grant and for the setting up of our office in Victoria was to implement changes to the recommendation, recommendations for changes to the uh, Human Rights Code. Uh, those recommendations were submitted by two past Human Rights Commissions in 1981 and 1983. At the time our idea uh, began, the budget and the new legislation had not uh, been in place. You're telling me that you applied for the Secretary of State grant did you apply for it before you knew about the social credit scrapping of the old code and the introduction of the new code? No, the actual application was submitted after, but it was in process. The, uh, you were thinking about it, but after the social credit brought down the legislation, you then put in your formal application. And in your application, did you tell the Secretary of State this was to fight provincial legislation? No. Our mandate is to uh, ensure that there is adequate protection in the human, ri human rights area for all people. And it is not necessarily to fight any uh, government. The, the whole point is that the new legislation and the, ol the old Human Rights Code did not provide um, total adequate coverage. In other words, you went to the Secretary of State before the legislation came down and said, we want to campaign for improvement in the Provincial Human Rights Code. We have uh, already received uh, certain amounts of money from the Federal Department of the Secretary of State even before this for uh, educational programs and uh, uh, 
educational programs to inform the, the public and, and the and government words, and everything. You were on the grant list and this time you went for a bigger grant and you got the $19,000. Now, yeah, that's true. Uh, very nice of you to tell me these things. The next question. You will, will you now use the $19,000 to mount a campaign against what you must regard as the gutting of the BC Human Rights Code? That the campaign is to, uh, or our office is set up to in, inform people who may be victims of harassment and discrimination. And it's not necessary to uh, launch any campaign against any government. If the Canadian uh, human rights uh, code comes under attack by a specific person that comes into our office, we will also lobby for that person the Canadian government as well, come, or Mr. any v. level of government. Now come, Mr. V, you know, we're all grown up human beings. You've got that $19,000, the big crisis is on what you regard as the gutting of the BC Human Rights Code, and you will use that money to fight the social credit legislation. Come on now, you must agree to that, admit that that's a correct interpretation. We will, we will oppose that legislation, yes. In other words, yes, yes. You see, I wanted, and I'm not trying to embarrass you at all, but even the most ordinary uh, people who don't take a great interest think it's very funny that uh, apart from Jack Austin's 600,000 badly times in solidarity, along comes another $19,000, which Attorney General Smith has called with some validity a sanctimonious interference in provincial legislation. You can see why he was mad, can't you? I, uh, I'm not really sure if, if uh, they're well, embarrassed, why they would be embarrassed. Uh, he's we a can't social do credit. about that. He's a social credit, he, and he's a lawyer, and he may be a little bit shamefaced about the weakening of the current human rights court. He's not going to tell me that. And then the hated feds give you, the Vancouver Island Human Rights Coalition, 20,000 bucks to fight his new legislation. Of course he's mad. Well, I, I wrote a letter to uh, Mr. McClellan. Uh, and it was in, in essence requesting some financial assistance for our project. <laughs> the, the, his executive assistant wrote back to me and said it would be brought to Mr. Mr. McClellan's attention. Mm -hmm. That's where it is right now. So we haven't just applied to the federal government for money. We've applied a blanket overall. We've applied to people like uh, the World Council of Churches private organizations. Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody objects to that, but I can see why Brian Smith is flipping his gasket. Now, what are you going to do with the money? You're going to be staffed by a paid staff? We're going to have one paid coordinator, and uh, a number of volunteers will be donating their time. And those who find unhappiness at the hands of the new social credit legislation or whose cases have not been dealt with because all the staff have been terminated can come to your office. That's true, or any human rights legislations. Okay, what's your phone number in Victoria? Our phone number is 382-3012. I, I hope you understand I've not been attacking you this morning, Mr. Vey. I've just been trying to set the record straight, and at least I now understand why Smith is so mad about it. Well, we appreciate it. We want the record set straight, too. Let me say to you the best of luck, Alec Vey, and I thank you for coming to our live studios in Victoria and uh, probably run into you again sometime. Thank you, Alec Vey. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Webster will go, would you believe it, haven't done one for months, to a jolly old-fashioned, frank, forthright, humorous, witty, knowledgeable and intelligent free-for-all based on your questions. Since I came back on the 6th of September, I have covered most of the major legislation which has been introduced, and there's no doubt about it, that came as a shock to many people in British Columbia. We've done Bill 2, we've done Bill 3, we've done part of Bill 6. Yeah, we've done Bill 6, we've done Bill, a little bit of Bill 9 this morning. We had the Minister of Health on about Bill 24, which is a medical services bill. And of course, I am anxious to hear from the medical profession when they have finally finished their 
closed door negotiations, although I did give you, at least if not them, the good news that the section about spying on pa patients' files would not be done by bureaucrats or civil servants, but that any examination under the patterns of practice committee to see if doctors are overbilling, that's what they're after really, I suspect, will be done at least by a member of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia. Now, it's, it's almost impossible to give an overview of the political situation in British Columbia at the moment, but understand some things. And I want to make myself quite clear, as old Nixon used to say before he didn't go to jail. The aims and objects of the legislation are in many ways in this society desirable. I don't argue with that at all. I take my provocateur's position from time to time so that we, the ordinary people, can understand the basic issues. Where the objections are, are a couple of things. One, the mandate was not, the campaign was less than frank, let's make that quite honest. And some of the arbitrary changes are far beyond what people's wildest dreams were of the trend of the move to the right by social credit. It is a significant move, perhaps not in thinking, but in practical application by the social credit cabinet to the right. And Bill Bennett, who will be on this program one of these days, has every right to tell you that he had total mandate for Bill 11, which is a permanent wage freeze in all public and sector operations. The time had come without any shadow of doubt to stop the continued explosion of the costs, not only of services, but of the costs of employment in British Columbia when so many people are suffering from heavy taxes. One of the problems, of course, is that the government priorities always seem to be somewhat in the wrong direction and that they are far too expensive and expensive. That little bit in the House the other day about increasing ministers' travelling expenses. All these fancy consultants, the great new media system, $18 million for communications within the government. But the fact is we are now in the middle of an almost total impasse in the House. Barrett's issue seems to me to be a reasonable issue that the rules were changed in the middle of the game. I have not been able to get a lucid government explanation on that, although they maintain that everything was done quite normally. Barrett is correct, and I think he is sincere when he says he doesn't care about the legislation when he's considering any restriction of freedom in parliamentary speech. At the same time, the public's business must be done with some reasonable dispatch. The shame of the situation now is that as these things develop and grow and hostilities develop, possibility of any rational dialogue between the two sides blows apart and the system of government is held up to some contempt and ridicule. Although, let me tell you, that's never my intention when I give you what I think about things. I have a call from Kermat. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. A couple of months before the election was called, Standard & Poor from New York downgraded the province's credit rating. Correct. And this is something that's being forced upon the social credit government in order to try and bring things back into... If it wasn't for that, it would be business as usual, and the province would have been sailing along the same way as it had been for the past four years. But the people in the, the, the lend the money to provinces, etc., have raised their interest rates, nearly doubled the cost of our uh, borrowing money for the province, and this has all been lost in the furor, you see. Furor is the word. And the second thing that, that uh, just I have a question that I'm sure is on the, que uh, the lips of many, many British Columbians. I sense the discreet hand of the Liberals planning a comeback in British Columbia and that Brian Mulroney might just lose British Columbia if the Socrates are successful in driving everybody away from the conservative type line. I can see it happening, and the, the Liberals must be chuckling like hell in Ottawa right now. Thank I, you. Thank you. But I may point out to viewers that on my very first day back, I said, long before I saw the DeBell report, 
that it would appear that the master plan of Bill Bennett was to create a climate of stability in British Columbia, attractive to overseas investors, and that one of the ways he was going to do that was to make it perfectly clear by his statutes and his cancellation of the BCGEU contract that in British Columbia, that great storehouse of resources for the export of primary resources, there would be a stable climate with the government clearly back in the driver's seat. Now, that's an honest interpretation. Next call is this one. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Doc. Morning. Uh, I agree totally with what Bill Bennett is doing. I think Dave Barrett, uh, if he would have won the election, I think the province would have been much worse off. Uh, just look at what they did to Saskatchewan. I'm from Saskatchewan. What the NDP party did to Saskatchewan, and now the Conservatives are in, and it's a much better place to live. And you regard all the steps, arbitrary or otherwise, and you have no objection to, of the move to the right or the wiping out of some of these educational and conciliation bodies, which have been very valuable to ordinary people. Uh, I think he might be firing them ro the wrong way, locking them out of their offices, uh, et cetera, like that, but I think he's doing the right thing. Well, I'm much obliged for your call, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Do go ahead. I completely agree with what Bennett's doing. I think he was given a, a full mandate, and I think there was further evidence of the people want restraint uh, in the Coquitlam by-election. I think it was very evident the NDP there crusaded against this thing, and the Conservatives got in and the NDP lost. And uh, I certainly have to agree with the what Bill Ritchie's trying to do, because I've been faced with trying to put up some buildings in Burnaby, and it would just, the day wouldn't be long enough to tell you what you gotta go through. Even I agree with some little knowledge of the incredible bureaucracies built at local levels. Uh, it's a question of technique and how you do it, I think, where Bennett and these people are running into some trouble. And don't forget, they're attacking a massively powerful bureaucracy. Oh, there's no doubt about it because it had to come and nobody's going to like it and you could set up regional offices for people to visit and they'd spend their days visiting them and, and then you just get pyramids of people. They're going to have to come back and say, now, what do we really need now that the smoke's clear? And I think they'll probably do it. Tell you a little story about a guy I know who's in business and he has a plant and things aren't going too good at the moment for obvious reasons. So around came a, an inspector, a factory inspector of some kind and said, You've got lots of lights, but they're facing the wrong way. Kindly ch put your overhead lighting at a 90 degree different angle. He said, no, I won't. It'll cost too much money. The guy then made a return visit, and it was a men-only plant. Went into the men's toilet and said, a circular toilet seat is not good enough. Kindly have that changed to a horseshoe toilet seat. <laughs> and my friend said, no, thank you, go away or words to that effect. Yep. Thank you very much. That's the kind of thing which has driven the most reasonable businessman run the bend. Oh, and you get provincial inspectors say one thing and the federals come and change it, and you're stuck in the middle. <laughs> I don't know. Much obliged. Thought I'd give you a little giggle. 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 Don't say that word very well. Giggle. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, something that Mr. Ritchie said uh, as far as saving money and cutting down on uh, expenses and whatnot. Yes. Uh, as far as impaired drivers, I don't understand the way that the, the laws are right now. They turn around and, and they give you a sentence and you spend 14 days in jail and you don't pay a fine. So it costs the government more money to keep the man in jail and guard him and, and feed him than it's worth. Let me put this particular contradiction which irritates me too. It would seem that from everybody's point of view, and I agree with it, that jail is a deterrent to repeated drunken driving. Yes. But every other bleeding heart, parole board, or anything else in the country seems to think that jail is the last place where you should put a major offender. So it, it, it points out a little strange little thing, that jail is only a deterrent to decent people, right? I see. Much obliged. After the break. <laughs> I, 
I know I'm on the air. I'm trying to control my laughter. A procedural wrangle is underway in the legislature of Victoria. I am reliably informed by a member of my staff, that Gordon Hansen, the designated speaker with unlimited time, has left the house to go to the washroom as a matter of urgent necessity. And now I understand that a social credit cabinet minister, I think it's Bob McClelland, is asking the speaker to rule that since Hansen has now left the chambers, debate on Bill 3 is complete for the designated NDP speaker. <laughs> I am waiting agog for Mr. Hansen's return from the washroom and a further bulletin of what may be the denial of either to go to the washroom or freedom of speech. Now, if anybody's been pulling my leg on this, I shall come on and apologize from top to bottom. But no, I'm sure it's right. Came from a good source. Now, line number three. Gotta have a laugh now and again. Go oh, ahead, Jack. please. Go ahead. That's you, sir. Uh, Jack, everybody keeps talking about a mandate, and uh, and the point I'd like to make is that uh, a mandate uh, can be given through the campaign. Now, if it's expressed through the campaign and the people vote on the issue, such as in the dictionary, it says it's defined as the wishes of constituents expressed to a representative, legislator, of constituents. Yeah, okay, etc. Is through an election and regarded as an order. Now. These things that the uh, Social Credit Party are doing uh, were not expressed in their campaign, and therefore they don't have a mandate for the particular things that they're doing. They have a mandate for uh, restraint, yes. And I'd like to come uh, over to the uh, Attorney General. Now, why can't they not just come out and say honestly that they're against human rights? They gave no money to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and, and why won't they just admit that? Now, if they're fighting Ottawa for giving money to someone that would help people with human rights, then they're obviously against it. Why don't they just come out and say they're against human rights and be honest with the people? Now, they do that all the way through on this legislation they're doing. One little correction I must make. There is a budget allocated of much the same for the new Human Rights Council. Whether or not it will be spent or not remains to be seen. Right. But I kind of disagree with you. Under the parliamentary system here, a politician can either follow his campaign promises or not follow them as he wishes if he has a majority. Well, while we're talking about the parliamentary system, I suppose that was very parliamentary when they kicked uh, Dave Barrett out of the legislature, uh, totally disregarding the rules. One other point I'd like to make, Jack, is that the, uh, that money that you keep saying was given to solidarity was given to the unemployed action groups. Now, why is the provincial government not in, interested in all, at all in the unemployed? Why do they offer no money and even opposition to any money going to unemployed action? Those are the same people that they're still putting thousands out of work. Agreed. It was probably a sound enough grant from the federal government, but it was given thoughtlessly and without proper preparation by the unemployment action groups who were exposed by BCTV as working actively in solidarity. They should have cleaned up their act before they took the money. Okay, agreed, but uh, he was giving them three or four days. Why has there not been a follow-up to see if they have cleaned up their act, Jack? Why I, must we carry on in that original assumption? I am and Perhaps it was true in the beginning, but is it true today? I'm That's quite sure that it is not true, technically speaking, today in the old solidarity work has been removed from the premises of the Unemployment Action Committees. I mean, Cuby's no fool. Well, Jack, as you say, the politicians, politicians can say anything they want to get in. That's correct. All right. Now, why cannot the unemployed action, and they are unemployed people, uh, thanks to policies, uh, some of them provincial, some of them federal. Now, why can they not take their money and use it the best way they see fit? as the government does in its, in its so-called mandate. Because it's given to them in conditions by another body of government. But I do get your point. Go ahead from Victoria. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Webster. Good morning. Um, I'd like to discuss the uh, Barrett issue and his uh, removal the other day from the House. I've been following it on your program the last couple of days, and I'd like to say I'm no expert on parliament, parliamentary procedure, but it would appear that maybe there's a technicality that hasn't been addressed. And without trying to sound like an apologist, I'm wondering, was Bill three formally brought before the House by the government prior to Barrett's attempt to debate it. Barrett, the, the bill was brought, through, brought up for debate on August the 16th. And Barrett was the main speaker on a motion to hoist the bill. 
He spoke for three hours and forty minutes. And then when he rose again to speak this time, it was ruled that the 40-minute time limit would apply on this occasion. And he says that the bills introduced, the procedure introduced by the NDP because of Bennett's complaints do not put a limit at any time on a designated speaker on a bill and that he was that designated speaker. But I guess it, appear, you know, it would appear that the system could be quite cumbersome and unwieldy and that uh, a designated speaker or a member otherwise of the House could stand up at any given time, as it were, and discuss basically any piece of legislation without it being formally uh, or brought oh, no. up on the agenda. That no, it's got to be on the table. I remember when Patsy Jordan spoke, she did a filibuster. What was it about again? I can't remember. And I think she was on her feet for 16 hours on one occasion. Well, Rosemary, Rosemary Brown did the same thing a couple years back. Yeah, 12 or 13 hours. Uh, in any uh, normal circumstances, where you have got whips and reasonable groups on either side, limits are generally set, but there always is the final and ultimate freedom to filibuster. Yes, I see. I, I, can see, I, I, mean, I mean, what upset Barrett was what he, what really upset Barrett was what he regarded as collusion between the Speaker and Schroeder and Bill Bennett. Well, I can Bill, understand, and if, if, in fact, that turns out to be the case, it's inexcusable, in my opinion, but... Yeah, Bennett says it's an outright lie. Yeah, my point remains that if it was not, and again, it's a possible technicality, that if it wasn't brought up on the agenda that particular day, uh, you know, he had basically nothing to, to debate then. Oh, I see the point you're making. Oh, about signal that wasn't going to come up. Yes, it was going to come up. No, it wasn't going to come up. Yeah, was it officially on the agenda? Yes, it was. And was Mark, it to be the first bill discussed that day? It was. Bill 3 had been called, had it not that day, of the Barrett ejection. It had been called on a hoist motion. Can you hear me? Yes, shout. That's what Dave Barrett had thought. His whip had told him it was. Yeah, his whip had told him. Matter of fact, I'll make a check on that right now. No, uh, his whip had told him uh, off the cuff. There's a lot of things that I appear to be uh, assumptions being made by Mr. Bennett, uh, pardon me, by Mr. Barrett, that uh, you know he assumed that the, the speaker waving at him to put his information in his file back in his desk meant that it wasn't going to be brought up. Plus this strange note, trust me. Yeah, I'll I, check. I agree. I, you know. Okay, I'll check that out for you. Okay, just a point. Yeah, good point. Sure. Thank you very much. Right. Bo it'll bore everybody else to death, but thee and me want to know. <laughs> well, like I say, I'm no expert, but it's just a curiosity. Yeah. Thanks. After the break. If it's a big story, you hear it first on Webster. The debate over the disappearance of Gordon Hansen, designated speaker on today's bill, who left to go to the washroom, is over. Hansen has resumed speaking. We now can tell you with authority that during this vital debate as to whether or not Hansen could go to the washroom, Walter Davidson was not on the chair. Bill Reed was there. Mr. Reed apparently was somewhat mixed up and let Hansen come back from the washroom and continue despite strenuous objections of Bob McClelland. Hansen continues speaking. Speaker Walter Davidson came running in late, apparently visiting the washroom himself, and he took over from Reed to establish some semblance of control. The great debate is over. <laughs> uh, Chetwind, British Columbia. Good morning, Jack. Just by the way, I have precisely two minutes to go to the washroom and back in the course of a program. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was just wondering if you're aware of the problems uh, the fellows in the construction camp are having oh. a mining company up here. No. Uh, the company's closing down the construction camp, and they're saying there's a few going to stay open, but they say it's going to cost 35 bucks a day, and there's a lot of people running into marital problems up here. And one of the local radio stations up here said, uh, a local lawyer said there's about 30 people that have come into his office and filed for separation because of the problems out of the mine. They just can't get together. Okay, are we talking about people working on the Sakanka project? Yes. Uh, what is the construction company that's closed down? 
it's just a contractor for the, the mining company. A contractor for the mining company who has been supplying living accommodation for miners. That's right. And is that company closing down for the winter period? Well, they're closing up for good. But there is one camp staying open, but the company wants $35 a day per person. And when the fellows got their families to support at home in that and payments, they can't afford that. $35 a day is three... Just a minute, three, five, two, a thousand and fifty a month. Right. Is that for accommodation only? Yes. Are your facts correct? Yes. Are you one involved? Yes. What's the name of the company? Well, it's for uh, qu quintet. It's for quintet. Yeah. How many men are still? Many men were working on it before the close down. Uh, about three hundred. How many men are staying in the accommodation? Well, they're phasing it out, so you know, right now there's only about a hundred. Have you seen the demand for $35 a day? Yes. Have they given the formal notice for the camp to be emptied at any specific date? Yes. When is that? The end of September. And you say the company, is it Quintet that you allege is charging $1,050 a month for accommodation? That's right. Does that include food? Yes. Oh, food and accommodation. Yes. And it's good food, isn't it? Oh, excellent. I mean, it's all you can eat plus. But there's not too many people that can afford this because they've got families at home to support, you know. And why are they staying up there if the job's closing down? Well, they're not closing down. They're just phasing the construction camp out. And they say that you've got to, uh, you know, supply your own accommodations uh, to work at the mine. And the company feels, well, if you don't want to go through this situation, there's lots of people that want your job. Well, I'll have to check this out. Uh, I was going to ask you something else. I was going to ask you something else. What's the other question there? Um, well, when are you coming down to Vancouver? Uh, I probably won't be down until uh, the middle of October. Well, why would you want to stay? Oh, I see what they're saying. Unless you find your own accommodation as we phase this out, we will charge you $35 a day for room and board. Right. I, I'm, I'm permanently working here, eh? Mm -hmm. you know, and majority of the people are. They're not just here for a few weeks. Or now, when you're permanently working there, is your room and board free? No. How much is it when you're working there? Uh, when you're working there, it's about uh, twenty dollars a day. And that you regard as reasonable? Well, up here, yes. What well, is this a union job? Of course it is. Yes. What's the union involved? Uh, tunnel union. Tunnel and rock workers. Yes. Local one sixty-eight. Yeah. One sixty. Okay, I'll get in touch with the tunnel and rock workers and with Quintet and tell you what I find the situation to be. I'm grateful for your, for your call. And you're calling from where? Chetwin. Chetwin. Yes. Thanks. I'm glad you so see me. I work at Quintet in uh, Bull Moose. They live in Chetwin. They commute every day. Okie dokie. Tell you what, give your name off the air to Liz. Liz, would you pick up 4-4 when I close it? Okay. And then I have time for another call, haven't I? Mm. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning, sir. Um, Ever since the last election and having voted for SoCred, unfortunately, I've been watching um, what's been going down with all the legislation, uh, legislation that's being brought in. Brings back um, a story of about 10 years ago when I lived in another province, the then Premier Robert Barassa, um, the election which put him in power with a majority government was very, very strongly based on language rights. Um, within several weeks of being elected, um, I think it was Bill 63 that he brought in, and by that, stabbed everyone in the back who voted for him, much as Mr. Bennett has now done. Um, I think next time the Speaker goes to the washroom, he should take with him the current legislation and put it to uh, proper use. Put it to the final time, flush it down the toilet, sir. Thank you very much. Where am I going? I can't see my numbers. Go ahead, please. Oh, hello, Jack. Hello. Uh, I don't understand why you haven't made more of an issue about the Matkin pension, because I can recall back in, was it 75, when you took Cass Biggs over the coals. Did I ever? You did, yeah, and here's Matkin, he's got that, you know, that slick-haired boy's got off pretty easy, I think, from you. Give me credit for breaking the story. One, let me fill in people. When the NDP were in power, snooping around as I sometimes do, I discovered that Cass Beggs, who had been brought in from Manitoba to run the BC Addo, I'd been quietly given by Alderman Council $10,000 pension for life, and uh, another senior official whom I shall not name got $7,500 for life. On this occasion, I established clearly 
The Jim Matkin gets a 15-year pension instead of a 10-year pension because of a generous policy of the government established in 1981 under Premier Bennett, whereby deputy ministers, who normally have a short lifespan, may buy a further uh, five years by putting in Matkin's case $20, $21,000. I said at the time it was generous. I checked it with Matkin. I, it increases his pension by about a third. I, and I make no apology for doing that story, and I hope the NDP will ask in the House how many other deputy ministers have benefited by the same generous golden handshake. I also pointed out that it was Mr. Matkin himself who had been largely responsible for Bill 11 before he left the provincial government and went to work for the Employers' Council of British Columbia. Could I, I mean, mention one other thing, Jack? Yes. Uh, you know, you talk about obstructionists and the people's perception of in Victoria, but now you look in the national scene and you look at the federal government, and you know, um, when it's on television and it's, there's more decorum there, but what gets me is when the conservatives with NDP filibuster or something, then the people generally say, well, good for them, they're stopping legislation, but when they do it in the provincial capital that you don't see anything, you, you know, outside of what the papers report, you get a different percep perception of the whole thing, and I think it's most unfair. I, I think it is unfair in its own way. I don't think it's planned in that way. Generally, federal issues are easier to focus on, uh, and once you get involved in the procedural wrangle, people tend to say, eh, but they must not lose sight of the fact that the job of any opposition, as Bennett did very successfully and not a dime without debate, is to oppose. Oppose, oppose, oppose. But uh, I don't know. Thanks very much for giving me the time. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Oh, tell me the program's nearly over. When you're having fun, time just passes. After the break. Hey, I'm going to chat up an old friend of ours in the morning. I haven't seen him for weeks. Don't know what he's doing. Seems to be going in all directions at once. What's his name again? Harcourt. Mike Harcourt. Then I'm going to do a piece on the collapse of the Dome Empire. Might be quite interesting. Webster's the name, talks the game, and the time is 9 a.m. precisely.